30 plus different countries. So I am Belen Gallego and I'm going to be your hostess today for this session, which is going to be about microgrids and islands. Uh, particularly, we're looking at how PV and batteries can help in this kind of uh, situ you know, situations where there is no grid connection necessarily. And with us today, we have two key experts uh, that are going to be telling us um, uh, more about what they're working on. First of all, I have Jason. Jason, please introduce yourself, unmute your microphone, and tell us where you're joining us from. Hi, my name is Jason Dane. Uh, hello, everybody. And uh, I'm the editor and publisher of a publication called Energy Storage Report. As its name indicates, uh, it really is focused on energy storage. We've been looking at this sector for the uh, best part of five years now. So since its earliest beginnings, really, uh, and I'm, I'm a journalist rather than a technical person. Uh, but what I do gives me an ability to perhaps see a global picture of what's going on in the industry and I'm going to be talking a little bit about what, what some of the trends that I'm seeing and some of the things that um, I think we need to be aware of as an industry. So where are you from? Where are you saying I'm, hi from today? I'm saying hi from, from Barcelona where it's nice and sunny, a uh, beautiful day and uh, yeah, I hope uh, everybody who gets a chance to come and visit uh, does so at some point. It'd be nice to meet you. Uh, I'm joining from Madrid. It's not sunny or anything here. So. <laughs> Uh, okay, so I, I think Jason adds here like the, the big picture. He talks to a lot of people that are um, experts and leaders in this industry, so he's going to have a lot to say and to add. And Taylor, tell us a little bit about you and where you're joining us from. Sure. My name is Taylor Sloan. I'm on the market applications team at Fluence. Fluence is an energy storage company. It's a joint venture between Siemens and AES. Uh, we have 56 projects in 15 countries and over uh, 500 megawatts of energy storage. So excited to talk about microgrids and islands this morning. For me, I'm in Washington, D.C., so this morning. Thank you very much. It's quite impressive, actually, your track record. I think it must be probably the company that's got the most or one of the most. Anyway, Jason, we're not going to take this any further. We're going to start with the presentations. So whilst Jason prepares his uh, screen, puts his screen up and stuff, i like to give you a few um, messages with the people who are listening to us. First of all, please share where you're joining from, like your name, I'm such, from such, you know, we always like to see, you know, and, uh, and our panelists always enjoy reading those things. Um, that's one thing. Another, we're recording this session and we will have also the PDFs available, which will be sent to you in a couple of days. So uh, worry not, you will get those materials. Third, there is a Q&A box at the bottom. In the toolbar, you can send your questions through there. And once both Jason and Taylor have spoken, then we will open uh, the questions. But you can send them while they're was. Sorry, I kept talking, but I got unmuted at some point. So uh, I'm, I'm not sure. Let me just say just one more thing. Please use the Q&A box for the, for the questions that you want to send, and we'll pick them up at the end once, once both of them have spoken. Jason, go ahead. Thank you, Belen. And as I said earlier, welcome to everyone to the uh, webinar today on renewables with battery storage uh, on microgrids and islands. Um, I think before, uh, before we get started, I'd like everybody to just imagine the last time you were on an island, uh, possibly on holiday, possibly beautiful beaches, sunshine. Um, I grew up on an island. They're beautiful places, many of them. They were always very special places, I think. And um, what I think is interesting about what we're doing uh, with microgrids and with storage and solar is, is we're trying to keep those uh, places pristine. So it's quite an important job. So just have that mental image in your minds as we go through today's session uh, of how beautiful some of these places are and how important it is to try and enable an energy transition there so that they can move off um, diesel and, and uh, things which are ultimately killing coral reefs and, and so on towards something which is much more sustainable and will hopefully keep these places beautiful and pristine in the future. Um, so as I said earlier, my name is Jason Dane. I'm publisher and editor of a, a publication called Energy Storage Report.info, if you want to look it up online. Uh, I am a journalist. I'm not a technical expert. Um, so I'm not going to go into technical detail, but I am going to talk about some of the trends that I'm seeing, particularly related to microgrids. Uh, and some of the observations and some of the things which I think we perhaps don't think about very often, but we ought to bear in mind when we embark on some of these microgrid projects. Um, so uh, 
one of the challenges I do want to highlight is a, is a perception one, actually. Um, clearly, microgrids do work, and uh, they work very well in certain circumstances, but I, I want to highlight how we need to be careful about how we sell them uh, and how we promote them. Um, there's a lot of different types of microgrid, obviously. I'm not going to get into the details of what is a microgrid, what isn't a microgrid. I think most of us accept that it's a, it's a grid that is, tends to be or can be isolated from, from a major grid. Uh, Islands are a good example, but of course we have uh, rural microgrids as well. Um, and I just wanted to share with you as a kind of kickoff point, some recent research that's come out of Navigant, uh, the, the research firm, uh, which has published its latest edition of a, a microgrid deployment tracker in the last week or so. Uh, now, according to Navigant, there are currently 1,869 microgrid projects around the world. Uh, which amount to roughly 20.7 gigawatts of capacity. So um, clearly, uh, it's a, a very uh, big market. Uh, it's growing. Um, and what we are seeing is that most of this uh, activity is actually happening off-grid. According to Navigant, remote projects are the ones that lead the microgrid segment at the moment. Um, and those are the ones I want to focus on, first of all, uh, just to kind of get an idea of uh, type of microgrid which we're seeing uh, quite quite often these days. Um, let me just see if I can move forward. There we go. So this is a this is a, a microgrid in uh, Mali in Africa. Uh, you can see it's actually a containerized solution uh, involving solar and lithium-ion batteries. And this is being commercialized by a company called Africa Green Tech. Uh, what they do is they put the whole thing together in Germany and then they ship it across to Africa. Uh, mainly they're active in Mali and Niger. And what they do is they, uh, they literally put it on a, on a truck, they truck it across the desert or across the wilderness, and then they drop it into a village which doesn't have uh, a grid connection. Um, when I spoke to them about uh, two or three months ago, they'd installed three of these containerized solutions already. Uh, they were shipping two more out to Africa and they had another 10 in production, plus they'd secured funding for a, quite a strong pipeline going forward. Um, now they reckon that they can, they're aiming to put together each container at a cost of 200,000 euros a piece, okay? Just to give you an idea of the, the capital expense. Um, what they do is when they take the container to a village, they then run cables around, sometimes up to, you know, sort of several kilometers of cable around the village and then they hook it up to the container so that they basically give all the village access to electricity. Um, now, what, they, what their business model is, they sell that electricity, uh, roughly uh, half a, a euro per kilowatt hour, um, which is about half the price of uh, diesel power in places like Mali, apparently. Um, and, um, and it's kind of a great little business because uh, the village gets electricity, and uh, the investors in Africa Green Tech get this kind of steady uh, income stream, which can last you know, 10, 15 years, as long as the container is out there producing energy. They have people on the ground who make sure the container is looked after. Um, the, the market for this kind of uh, uh, off-grid, uh, rural microgrid um, so a type of deployment, apparently, according to TH Energy and another analyst firm is worth uh, around uh, 50 megawatt hours worth of, of uh, projects a year. Um, and uh, so again, we see that it's uh, potentially a, a great little area to get into. The challenge that you have, uh, as far as I can tell, and speaking to people who operate in this area, is making a profit on these kind of projects. Um, so last September, I saw a presentation by a company called Spark Meter, uh, which has installed, at the time it installed 22 and a half thousand off-grid smart meters so they're the ones who are measuring the uh, electricity that's being delivered by these kind of projects. And what they found was that, um, according to their meters, people are only using about two kilowatt hours of energy a month, uh, which is not a lot, obviously. Um, the price, again, is very low. It's about 55 uh, cents, dollar cents, which is kind of more or less what we were seeing with Africa Green Tech per kilowatt hour. Um, so there's not a lot of profit in that. And so their average revenue per user, uh, they said, was usually around less than $5 per site, okay? Um, so in terms of 
uh, business, it's a tricky one. Um, but in terms of perception, uh, it's obviously a winner. You're going in, you're helping these communities. Uh, if you can make the numbers work, it's a great area to get into. Um, and everybody comes out looking very good. Now, what happens when we move to situations where people have higher electricity needs? Well, then things get more complicated. Um, and that's what I want to look at next. So uh, what we, when we go to islands, uh, and this one here is uh, Porto Santo, which is uh, an island uh, just uh, close to Madeira in the, in the uh, Atlantic. Um, what we see there is uh, situations where people have a higher standard of living. Typically, you know, they may be um, European, American uh, in terms of their uh, affluence. Um, and uh, they, they do still have a grid which is very limited. Um, so pretty much a, an island grid tends to be a microgrid by definition. And most of them do rely on diesel. So it's very expensive for them to generate the electricity that they have there. And they're using quite a lot of it. Um, so we see a lot of interest, of course, in moving these islands away from traditional uh, fossil fuel generation to renewables and to battery storage. Um, and uh, just to give you a kind of little idea of how important this market is, uh, I was looking back on some headlines and in May last year, um, Tesla, 36% uh, of all of Tesla's storage capacity apparently was on islands at the time. Um, now, this is all great and the business case looks a lot better than it does for some of the off-grid things we were looking at earlier. But this is where I want to come on to the perception challenge that we face. Um, when we look at a lot of these island microgrid projects, um, usually the tendency is to say, okay, we're going to uh, take this island and we're going to drop in some solar panels and we're going to put in some batteries and we're going to kind of take out all the fossil fuels and often they're labeled as being fully renewable or 100% renewable. Um, in practice, um, that's uh, often more of a problem than people may appreciate. And I, I think there may be a danger here for us as an industry. Um, so I want to take a, a, a quick look at one example, which is uh, possibly a, a lesson we should all bear in mind. Uh, this is El Hierro, which is the southwesterly most of the Canary Islands, again in the Atlantic, um, a little further down from Porto Santo, which we were looking at earlier. Um, they installed a very high profile uh, island grid, we call it a microgrid project if you like. Um, and it's called Gorona del Viento. It's been in development a number of years. Um, and of course the aim in all the uh, reporting that we saw at the time was to get El Hierro off fossil fuels. Um, now, important to say that this island grid does not use batteries at the moment. Uh, when it was originally developed, batteries were, were not a cost effective uh, option. And so what the planners decided to do was to use a combination of wind and pumped hydro. Uh, they have two lakes, uh, one at the top of a mountain, one at the bottom, and they were gonna use that as a kind of reservoir, battery reservoir. In theory, it shouldn't be a bad idea because pumped hydro has got massive capacity uh, and you know, long-term, very low cost of energy storage. So it uh, looked like a good idea on paper. And the idea was that this system was gonna probably allow the uh, island to, to, to stop using around 80% of the diesel uh, fuel that it was originally uh, consuming. The problem is that so far it hasn't worked. Um, there's uh, not a lot of um, publicity now coming out of this project, which is interesting in itself. Um, but at least one person, Roger Andrews, who writes for a publication called Energy Matters, has been looking at the uh, grid behavior on the island and, and adding up the numbers to see uh, what's happening as a result of this project. In January, he calculated that Gorona del Viento was meeting about 46% of El Hierro's electricity needs. That's just electricity, not total energy. So it's obviously quite far short of the 80 plus percent that the uh, planners were hoping for. Um, and it looks like uh, there have been some badly uh, designed aspects of this project because when they started to look at how much it would take to go fully renewable, the uh, capacity of the hydro storage they calculated would need to be expanded by at least 40 times, uh, which is uh, clearly impossible because this is a very small island. Um, so this is a project that's been running for a number of years now. We have an operating history and it's not looking as good as it was first uh, um, supposed, to, supposed to look. Uh, and clearly adding batteries into this equation 
isn't really going to help much. Although one of the original ideas was to increase the storage further through uh, electric vehicles, battery storage, and, uh, and demand response. Now, we could, we could argue that this is a unique uh, setup for the island, that it was badly planned, but if you look at some of the other small island uh, grids that, that exist around the world, we do see similar challenges. So I've seen a, another study of a place called Thursday Island, which is off the coast, coast, of Austra uh, coast of Australia. And again, Thursday Island has plenty of wind power, but they're only certain, it's only there certain times of the year. Um, and uh, the author of this particular study said that uh, to get fully renewable, to be able to tide over the times when there's no wind and it's calm, you'd need around 3.2 gigawatt hours of storage uh, to, to, to take care of that. Now, to give you an idea, that's about 25 times the size of Tesla's mega battery that was installed in Australia last year. And that's just for one island. So when we're looking at uh, putting in microgrids, renewable energy microgrids into islands, I think it's fair to say that we can pretty easily, I would argue, get to double digit percentage of, uh, of removal of traditional uh, generation. But as you get close to that kind of magic 100%, the full eradication of fossil fuels, the amount of storage that you may need could be uh, very large indeed. And of course, the costs go up with it too. Um, so what does this mean? Um, I just wanted to end with a, a, one final uh, uh, island example. This is the uh, island Isles of Scilly off the coast of Cornwall in England. Again, a microgrid project happening there, um, looking at combining electric vehicles with battery storage, uh, demand response, and of course renewables to try and uh, reduce the, the dependence on, on fossil fuels. I just wanted to leave with this, um, I, this thought which as we go forward and we develop more and more uh, island microgrids, we need to be very careful about what we promise. Um, these island microgrids in many respects are the ultimate tests of what we can achieve with renewable energy. If we can take islands fully off fossil fuels, then that's great. And these are test cases, therefore. Uh, they're often very high profile as a result. And I know that uh, Taylor's gonna come on to speak to some of the practical experience. But just for anyone out there, uh, as a journalist, I would urge you to be realistic about the claims that you make when you work with island microgrids. Um, bear in mind, it not, might not be so easy. The world is watching and uh, we wanna make sure that we have credibility going forward um, and that people do believe we can achieve what we say rather than overclaiming and then failing to do that. I'm gonna hand over to, back to Belen in a second uh, for uh, uh, Taylor to, to uh, have a quick chat. Before I do, I know there's a lot of you from around the world I'm going to make an announcement on behalf of uh, Fluence, which is Taylor's uh, company. Uh, he doesn't know this probably, but they are recruiting at the moment. So if you're looking for a new job, go to uh, energystoragereport.info. And there's some details that went up on the site yesterday. And I'm sure the recruitment agency who's, who we're working with would be uh, keen to hear from you. That's all from me. I'll hand back to Belen. Thank you very much. So in just a little bit over 10, uh, 10 minutes, we learned a lot about the solar energy storage. We learned that uh, there are jobs available in st energy storage. So you're welcome, guys. And also, you really, really, really want to go on holiday now, don't you? At least I do. <laughs> there are too many pictures of nice islands. Uh, and now I'm going to hand over to Taylor so that we can, you can give us a little bit more what Fluence has been working on. And Fluence has a lot of experience, you know, 56 projects, I think you said. So whilst Taylor gets up his um, presentation and gets ready, just a reminder that you can send your questions. So far we have one, we will ask this question uh, afterwards, but just um, do send them through. And uh, uh, absolutely amazing. Um, outstanding today, we have people from Australia and it's pretty late there to uh, LA and it's very, very early there. So we have people from Tanzania, from everywhere. So welcome you guys, you know, it's a pleasure. And Taylor, Great, go for it. thank you, Bailin. Are you able to see my screen? We are, yes. Okay, fantastic. Uh, well, thank you very much for everyone for joining and thank you, Jason, for that uh, introduction. Uh, I wanted to build upon sort of some of the themes that Jason mentioned. So Jason men mentioned that sometimes the, the biggest barrier is not a technological one. We have the technology. It's more about building a business model that makes it economic. So I'd like to talk about four uh, real examples from projects we worked on where 
we found that the economics have worked. And hopefully from these uh, examples, you can think about um, where and where energy storage will work for you. So the first, next slide, oh, there we go. I wanted to give some structure to these examples and have four examples from different types of situations. And, and the biggest thing to think about for microgrids and islands and in terms of how to group projects is if it's grid connected or if it's off grid. Because that's a, a big difference. If something is grid connected, uh, the main concern is about risk management and resilience. That's the big buzzword, resilience. Whereas if you're off grid, it's the, grid, the microgrid is your plan A. There is no other grid to connect to. Um, whereas if it's grid connected, the microgrid is your plan B. So if it's off grid, it's more about fuel reduction rather than risk management. The second difference I wanted to make, and this is sort of arbitrary, but at a certain point, a microgrid becomes big enough that it becomes an islanded grid. So for the purposes of this presentation, I'll, have, I'll define that as 10 megawatts. So I'll, I'll give an example from each of these four boxes in order uh, to, to give a little more flavor to the types of projects we've looked at. And I have examples of each box. So, um, you know, box one would be hospitals, water treatment plants, airports, uh, grid connected islands would be full on islands, off grid microgrids would be remote communities like Jason mentioned, and then an off grid, uh, an islanded off grid would be a large utility island um, like a Puerto Rico. So let me start off with box one of a grid connected microgrid. And as I mentioned on the previous slide, the, the key challenge here is about giving a facility or campus resilience in case the grid does, does go down. What's the plan B? So we, were, we, looked, we worked with a water treatment plant uh, and in 2012 during Hurricane Sandy, the water treatment plant lost grid power. And when a, when a water treatment plant loses power, it can no longer treat any water. And it has two options. It can either back up the pipes for everyone or it can discharge that water into the river. So unfortunately, during the hurricane, they were, after the hurricane, they were forced to discharge millions of gallons of untreated sewage into the local river, um, causing a, quite a, a crisis for the local rivers. Um, so after this, they said, never again. We want to have a microgrid that gives us 10 days of, of power so that if this, another hurricane comes, we don't have to discharge sewage into our rivers. And so what they did was they added uh, solar PV diesel on a battery. Uh, and what the battery did was it complements the PV nicely in order to uh, help with the intermittency of solar generation and also to shift some of the, the solar generation uh, to the evening so that you're using less fuel because getting to 10 days is, would require a lot of on-site fuel. So if you have a requirement like that, you need to be as efficient as possible with the fuel that you do have. The next example that I'd like to talk about it's also grid connected, but now it's a little bigger. It's an island. So this is an island in Europe, and it's connected to the continent, the mainland Europe, with a sub one subsea cable. The issue is, if that cable ever goes down, the entire island loses power. Hospitals, banks, police stations, everything. Um, so when thinking about providing a backup plan, uh, the solution here is to have a battery that can provide a bridge while the island gets its on, own island, on island generation up and running. So the battery essentially provides power to critical loads like the hospitals and the banks uh, for several hours while the diesel engines are started. And, and because the battery has the ability to char uh, charge and discharge very rapidly, you can bring the on island generation, the diesel gensets up much more quickly because they don't have to worry about synchronizing to the grid or any frequency issues because the battery handles that. So the, the key here is that the island, the critical loads on the island will never lose power if the subsea cable doesn't work. And even once that does happen, the generation, the power is restored much more quickly than it would be otherwise. So those are two uh, grid connected examples. And again, the key there is about risk management and resilience. What's the plan B? Now I'm gonna talk about two off-grid examples where it's more about minimizing fuel costs because the battery, the, the microgrid is the plan A. And, and this first example is an island, but remember I'm anything under 10 megawatts, I'm calling a microgrid, so it's a little confusing. This is a microgrid example, not an island example. 
And this is an island in Europe called uh, Bentotene. It's a it's a quite a small island. It used to be a prison island, kind of like the Alcatraz of Europe, if you're familiar with Alcatraz. And they have four diesel generators on the island. And in order to meet the short term peaks in demand, they were forced to run uh, set one or two of the of the generators at a minimum load in order to be able to ramp up quickly if, if there was an unexpected jump in demand. And and as I, can sh I show on the graph on the right for the more technical folks out there, you don't really want to run your generators at min load because from a fuel efficiency perspective, it's not very good. This is called a heat rate curve. So if you're running two engines at point A, 240 kilowatts, that's much more fuel intense than running one engine at point B, which is 480 kilowatts. So with the battery, adding a battery to, to a grid like this, allows the battery to charge and discharge rapidly to meet these short-term uh, peaks. And then you can turn off one or two of these engines running on min load and just run two engines at full. So this is, would be considered a spinning reserve replacement for the more technical folks out there. Um, and it also helps mitigate uh, any solar penetration on the, on the grid that if a cloud flies over and, and the solar uh, generation drops suddenly, uh, the battery would be able to accommodate that change. The last example is, is an island now, so it's bigger than the last example, a bigger island, it's Hawaii. Uh, and what what's going on in Hawaii is that, on Kauai specifically, if you look on the graph on the right, they, they have solar penetration, but they also have a lot of, of oil generation. And, and when the sun goes down at six, seven o'clock at night and everyone's coming home from work and watching TV and turning on appliances, uh, they don't have any solar power to cover that. That time. So they end up bringing on really expensive generation that's really dirty and polluting to cover that. So the play here is to actually shift a, a good portion of that solar generation in the middle of the day to cover the peak. So I'm, I'm representing that with the dark gray on the right side of the graph. Shift, shift the, the peak generation four hours into the evening and then turn off all those uh, really inefficient old generators that are previously running. And to give you an example, an idea of cost on this, the average cost of generation on this island, island was uh, 33 cents per kilowatt hour. And, and KIUC, the, the local utility there, was able to sign a, a power purchase agreement, a PPA for 11 cents a kilowatt hour. So much less expensive than the average cost um, to bring down the average cost of electricity on the island. And by the way, as an added bonus for islands, this is real data that we have from the Dominican Republic during Hurricane Maria. Uh, batteries are very good at charging and discharging rapidly. So during the hurricane, when everything, when trees were falling and generators were getting cut off uh, from the grid and loads were disconnecting, the battery was able to maintain the frequency more or less stable during that uh, event to keep things uh, as functional as possible. So that's sort of an added bonus um, it adds to re the resiliency of an island during uh, things like hurricanes. So this is my last slide. I just wanted to summarize overall, when will the economics of energy storage work for the examples that I've described previously? For off-grid microgrids, the key is if there's very expensive fuel, often it is very expensive because of remote locations, and if there's grid stability issues uh, caused by solar intermittency. For grid connected, the key is if there's an extremely high cost of a power outage, like the water treatment plant I, I mentioned where they're discharging millions of gallons of sewage. If that cost is very high, you can't afford to not have a plan B. And then islands, uh, the last example, if, you have, uh, if you're not running at your optimal heat rate and there's an opportunity to turn off some of your engines and use a battery um, to, opt to, to conserve fuel, um, that's, that's a key case where an island would work um, economically, or if there's grid stability issues caused by solar intermittency. Uh, thank you very much. I, I hope these four examples have given people ideas about the types of situations where we're seeing uh, storage on microgrids and islands work today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Taylor. Thank you very much, Jason. So you've got both, and when I say you, I mean you guys in the audience, you've got the details for both Taylor and also for Jason, so you have you know, any questions you want to contact them, you can, or, you know, get in touch with us. We're happy to make an introduction. 
So you have been quite quiet, guys. Normally, you know, by by now I have a, a million questions that I don't even know where to pay attention to, but you're being quite shy today. So we do have two questions and I have one myself. Uh, so we'll start with that, but please can you send your questions through uh, now as we're going through the questions um, so that we have them ready for when we go through this. We are going to have, I think, at least uh, 10, 15 minutes of questions and answers, so please send them through. Okay, so the first question I have uh, for you guys uh, would be, you know, there has been in the news lately the issue of Puerto Rico, you know, what's happened there, what can be done. Um, so I was just hoping to refer to you as the two experts and see if you can give me a little bit of a, um, I guess, an update of, you know, what happened, how did we get there? Some people here may not be um, so familiar with the, with the case study and how, how will this be fixed? So I don't know who wants to take it first. And then, you know, I know the two of you probably have a lot to say. So Taylor, why don't you start and then Jason, you can add. Sure, I'd love to. Um, I'm actually gonna share my screen again because I have a Go picture that shows Puerto Rico so that everyone has a little more context. So what happened in Puerto Rico was a hurricane uh, completely destroyed the transmission, mostly the transmission assets of the island. And the generation assets were mostly okay, but they didn't have any, any transmission lines to connect the generation to the load. Uh, so this happened, uh, I think about six months ago, and the restoration process has been extremely long. Uh, I think maybe even still 30% of people don't have their power restored. Um, you know, for several months, the majority of the island didn't have any power. It was a, a pretty much a crisis on the island. Um, hospitals didn't have power. Um, so the, the opportunity, I think, for microgrids and on an island situation like this is to add resilience to the island rather than replacing what was there previously, which was the standard centralized generation and then transmission assets, go to a more compartmentalized approach that's more resilient um, so that if one of those transmission lines goes down, the whole island doesn't go down. So AES, which is, um, which is what the company, that it's a 50% 50, 50 owner of Fluence, put out a vision of actually turning Puerto Rico into seven mini grids. I know we're talking about microgrids, but a mini grid, I guess, would be slightly larger than a microgrid. And, and the idea is that each of these mini grids could operate on its own if it needed to during a hurricane, but usually they would all be interconnected and operating as one, uh, one hive grid, I guess you could call it. And then there are also two transmission lines cutting across the island. Um, but if they go down, again, the whole island doesn't go down. So I think this is an example uh, of how you could go from a centralized model to a more decentralized model and use solar plus storage uh, instead of using fossil fuels, which are really expensive to import to an island like Puerto Rico. And since everything was destroyed, they have a fresh start. They can start from scratch rather than um, just, it's, it's more difficult if, if, you're, if you don't have a, an opportunity to start from scratch like they did in Puerto Rico. So I think it's an interesting case study of how the, the island grid of the future could look. And uh, Jason, what, what are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, so I, I mean, I won't comment on the technical aspects because you've actually, you, you know, AES or Fluence now has been on the ground there, so you know more about the, the detail. I think my observation is that uh, uh, going back to my point about the, the level of uh, uh, global interest in this, um, like you say, Puerto Rico really is uh, a very interesting case study uh, because it's been so badly damaged, because it is a green, effectively a greenfield uh, site now for, for, for microgrid, mini-grid integration. Um, there's going to be a lot of attention placed on how well this, this, this does uh, going forward. What I do see, and I think it's heartening here, is that it seems to be a very intelligent design that's being put in place. And so um, bearing in mind that the energy storage uh, market is growing up rapidly, it's maturing rapidly, I'd like to see this becoming a, like you say, a role model really for how this could be done in other places. Um, clearly there are political interests and we've already seen uh, a lot of power plays uh, being uh, kind of playing out in, in, this, uh, in, in this particular uh, situation. But I think if, if the, the, the engineers can get it right uh, and the, the companies like, like Fluence and the others who are involved in the rebuilding of the island are given the opportunity to do something which makes technical sense, 
then this could be a really strong uh, case study of, of why microgrids make a lot of sense, not just because of the energy costs that we've talked about previously, but also to your point earlier, uh, to do with resiliency uh, and the ability to ride through severe weather events, which of course, uh, again, are very, very significant in the case of islands uh, in many cases. So uh, looking forward to hearing much more about this. And I think it's a, um, uh, one definitely to watch and, and hope it works out well. So Fluence will have to come back after they get all the projects in Puerto Rico. <laughs> come back and tell us about them. Um, okay, so actually, guys, well done. You're not shy anymore. Now you've sent a lot of questions, which means you guys are under... Um, we have time, but you know, there is uh, 14 questions and I'd like to get through as many as possible. So, first, um, this is one for you, Jason. Uh, try to keep it short because we can go on for this, you know, uh, what went wrong in El Hierro? Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, yeah, so <laughs> a very good question. And I think uh, this is perhaps relevant, relates quite closely to the Puerto Rico example and elsewhere. Uh, the El Hierro project was in development for a number of years, uh, and in fact, a number of decades, it's fair to say. Uh, and because initially there seemed to be, uh, uh, it was a very interesting uh, project from a political perspective, uh, the impression that I get is that the uh, project was somewhat hijacked by the, uh, the policymakers, the politicians on the island. And there were some indications before the project got underway that actually uh, on the technical level, it may, uh, there may have been some uh, problems uh, and it seems that um, the, the project went ahead despite this because there was a vested interest in, in trying to push for this 100% renewable badge. Um, so I think, as a, to my point earlier on about Puerto Rico, if, if, if the technical people can be left to get on with things and do things in an, in an intelligent way, hopefully we can avoid this kind of problem in the future. Basically, there were technical challenges that haven't been resolved and probably won't be resolved. Uh, in uh, El Hierro, uh, and uh, it's good to say, see uh, Taylor's examples uh, where clearly there are, there's a very great need and it's being satisfied without being, uh, you know, ma major claims being made along the way. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, so Gaza, like I don't know a lot about um, how exactly it works in Gaza and Palestine. I do quite a lot of work in there, but uh, I'm not really familiar exactly you know, how it works in terms of um, the grid, how connected they are to where, but what it says in here is that um, engineer Fadi sent through, it says that they have six hours of, uh, of actually energy and the rest of the day is really down. You know, is there a solution that can be done in terms of using this technology? And I guess this question is for you, Taylor. Sure. So this sounds like it's a grid connected type of situation. So what I, it sounds like what you would want to have is a microgrid that is grid connected. So as long as you're importing power during the day, that's fine. But then the second that that grid connection is lost, the microgrid can instantaneously island itself. And then you can sustain power with uh, the local generation assets, diesel and solar PV and batteries. So that'd be my recommendation. I honestly don't know anything else about Gaza. So I'd want to see more. I would want to learn more before I could give a more complete answer. I completely agree. I mean, this is the one of those things, right? Knowing more, we could actually come up with maybe like the best solution. But I mean, it's a good technology for that sort of situation. It's just a question of actually figuring out what is the need. Okay, so there are several types of batteries, of course. One of the questions here talks about um, f for each of sort of the battery types, what is the barrier that is associated with with things uh, like lithium iron, lead acid, and and what is the cost? So just an idea of you know how the market is structured, I suppose. Do you want to take this one? Yeah. Um, I, I don't know that much other than about lithium-ion batteries, so I, I can't answer about. Uh, Jason, Jason, what do you want to hear? Yeah, I, without going into too much detail, as I understand it, the, uh, clearly that there are a number of factors that enter into the choice of battery. Uh, what we're seeing, and I, I'm sure Taylor will back me up on this right now, is that lithium ion is uh, coming down in cost massively because of uh, the impact of the electric vehicle industry. Uh, so in energy storage, we're getting a bit of a free ride on a much larger market. Uh, at the same time, the companies that are making these batteries are very, very large indeed. They're unlikely to ever fail. So the bankability is uh, very, very good. Uh, this means that when you're looking at lithium-ion, 
Uh, it tends to be a favored option. Uh, lead acid, of course, uh, much older um, and more established uh, in, in some respects kind of um, uh, proposition. But I understand that some of the um, uh, functionality of lead acid isn't as good for, for the typical cycling that we see uh, in many modern uh, energy storage um, applications. So we're seeing lead acid being sort of uh, more or less uh, left to one side and lithium uh, ion taking over. Um, there are other battery uh, types, of course, but increasingly it's becoming a one horse race. And I think, um, you know, certainly at Energy Storage Report, our feeling is that if you're in the business of building batteries and you're not building lithium ion, you've got a, a tough time uh, achieving commercialization and achieving scale of sales. Yeah, and give a little more context on that. Um, in the last quarter, in Q4 of, of 2017, 98.8 percent of energy storage projects were lithium ion um, so it's definitely like like Jason said the it's a one horse race thank you very much uh, Jason I just uh, muted you there because we had a little bit of feedback from what Taylor was saying but you know just feel free to unmute yourself on the next question um, there is a question here that I wonder whether you guys uh, can or want to answer, which is what is the average cost of installed kilowatt hour, ah, Taylor is smiling, on batteries uh, that you are seeing in the market today? Can we discuss this or can well, we be let me, let me just change. I, I think that the right way to think about batteries is kilowatts rather than kilowatt hours um, because batteries provide capacity. Um, so I, I would actually even question that I think kilowatt hours is the wrong way to think about batteries. Um, but okay. in, in terms of specific costs, uh, I would say that there, for competitive, we can't share cost information be, just because it's competitive intelligence that we can't share publicly. Um, but I will say that there is a number of public reports, like Green Tech Media will will give has reports that give estimates of of battery costs for 2017 as well as projections for the future. So I would, I would start there to get an idea of how much these costs, but also keeping in mind that for microgrids and islands, it'll probably be more expensive than utility scale projects in the United States, just because they're more re remote locations. You would need to have uh, la local labor or people traveling to the sites to install it. So it is also locational, location specific, but as a starting point, I would start with uh, industry reports that are available. There's also a lot of information from Bloomberg, although that is more linked to the electric vehicle, but still, I don't know if you, Jason, do you want to add anything or go ahead with that? Uh, I, I just say that as a, as a journalist, uh, the first question that I ask any battery company is how much um, their batteries cost, and they normally give me a price, and then it doesn't seem to compare with anything else we see. And the, the battery cost is, uh, Battery pricing seems to be a dark art. Uh, it's very difficult to get reliable information. I would definitely uh, side with, with Taylor's uh, advice to go to uh, the uh, analyst firms. I would also say that we're seeing, and I'm sure everyone back me up on this, a uh, massive drop. So the price that you get today is not the price you're going to get in six months time. Um, and uh, it, it's very difficult to know. Just one final thing. Uh, the cost itself it seems to be a movable feast. Uh, it does depend on whether you look at the battery for power or for energy, as Taylor pointed out. It also uh, depends on whether you're looking at things like uh, uh, install costs, whether you're taking into account parasitic losses. Um, so there's a, a whole bunch of uh, variables which can give you a different outcome for a given battery under different circumstances. Um, my advice is uh, find somebody who is independent and knows uh, plenty about the technical aspects to do your costing. And also bear in mind that cost may not be the only thing you need to look at. There's other variables as well, which may make a difference to your choice of battery in a uh, particular situation. That's what I get told by the people who, um, who work on these kind of projects. Yeah, I, I would add to think about the revenue side. So I gave four examples of, the, of places where the economics have worked. So if you're thinking about an example that's similar to those, it's more likely to work than, than an example that is, is much different or, or less attractive than the examples I presented. 
Um, when are the, mo the main points to be considered when sizing the battery storage system in Hawaii, in the last example that you gave, uh, Taylor? In other words, how do you recommend a suitable battery storage size? What are the main points to tackle in general? Yeah, this is also, uh, this is also an interesting question, and it depends on, on the grid. So for Hawaii, the main issue was that they had really expensive oil generation covering the evening peak. So they used uh, a ratio of the solar, uh, solar PV, I think was 27 megawatts and the battery was, I'm, I'm forgetting numbers, 20, something like that. It was like 80% of the size of the solar PV. In other cases, um, maybe only 30% is necessary, but in Hawaii, the reason they wanted 80% is because they looked at what do I need to replace? I need to replace all of these expensive diesel generators. So how much do I need to do that? So I would say think about what you're trying to do with the battery um, and then work backwards to size the battery. Um, that, that's probably my best advice. Thank you very much. Uh, we actually lost Jason just now. Hopefully he'll, uh, he'll come back, uh, back in. But in the meanwhile, I'm just going to keep going with questions for you, if that's OK. Um, we've seen that battery systems can support frequency stability, but are they also suitable to support voltage stability? Uh, yes, they are. I'm not a technical person, but we've used uh, batteries to provide voltage support for pairing with solar projects. So uh, it can control uh, voltage as well, yes. Okay. What can be done, this is a bit of a political, in order to push governments to see sustainability potential for off-grid or micro, mini-grids for isolated communities? You know, like, um, you have the know-how, but how do you convince governments that this, this is a worth pursuing? That's a very difficult question. I think, I think it requires a coalition, right? Of, I don't think one, I don't think there's one, a one size fits all answer. Um, there's, you know, there's Paris climate accords, there's overall national level goals, there's community level goals, there's state and province level goals, I think, and all of the box, all of the above type of solution um, is the way to move it forward. But I think it's highly dependent on, on the country and political situation. I suppose you'd have to analyze as well, you know, what's the cost of actually building a grid to, to deliver power there instead of building a mini grid. But you have to crunch the numbers, I suppose. So it's a bit of a difficult yeah. situation. Uh, does Fluency a business case for other battery technologies such as uh, lead or flow batteries? So Fluence, uh, we're technology agnostic. So we, we don't make any batteries ourselves. We buy them and then we integrate the systems. So we're a system integrator. Um, I haven't seen any activity for lead acid. I think flow batteries are interesting in the future, potentially, if costs come down. Um, they, they haven't come down yet. So it's, we're just kind of, we're waiting. But um, in the next five to 10 years, I think that lithium ion will be the dominant technology. And what about pump hydro? Someone asks here, um, you know, do you see this as a possibility as a player within a mine, uh, microgrid? It looks like Jason that? says he's rejoined as a participant. Um, he wants to know if he can be added as a speaker. <laughs> okay, don't worry, we will let him know. <laughs> so if you can just add, uh, ask, uh, well, sorry, answer that uh, pump hydro and I'll just find him and add him. Yeah, pumped hydro has been around for a very long time. I think the constraint the challenge with pumped hydro is finding places to site additional pumped hydro because most of the places that are suitable for it have already been used. So uh, that's a constraint. And then also uh, you can't site pumped hydro in next to cities, for example. So an example uh, from Fluence is that San Diego and California needed capacity. Um, so they added energy storage directly in downtown San, San Diego. It, it wouldn't be possible to site a, a pumped hydro project in downtown San Diego because you would need a mountain and a giant lake. So uh, that's another consideration. Most, mostly it's related to siting issues. Okay, and what about this one? And you know, we have Jason back on. Uh, thank, thank you, Jason, for coming back. Um, Just a cautionary note there, uh, my battery ran out, funnily enough. Uh, <laughs> see, oh, <laughs> you need the microgrid. <laughs> Ah, uh, speak to Taylor, he can furnish <laughs> one. Uh, 
what is the possibility? This is an interesting question, I think. Joaquin uh, is asked, what is the possibility of developing a PV plant only to inject energy at night? Uh, uh, you know, just kind of like he, his point is, of course, that depends on cost, etc. But would it be feasible if you were to put a large number of batteries? So it's basically have a PV plant that produces no power during the day and saves all of its power for the nighttime. Yeah. So the, the point is, is this feasible considering you know the cost of batteries currently? Um, I'd say it's more it's more economically challenging. The low hanging fruit, of course, is to use solar and, and, and batteries to just to produce during the day and offset any diesel generation during the day and then also the evening peak. Um, th that would be my first recommendation. Uh, the, the next stage is to try and go for the full, you know, 24 seven solar plus storage. Uh, that's more difficult economically. So I'd say the, as a starting point, you have to walk before you can run. So I would say first, think about just getting solar plus PV to back out daytime and evening electricity needs. And then the next stage would be trying to go to the full 100%. I would uh, I'd just add to that, perhaps, um, yeah, the, the thing that's a concern if you've just tried to use solar to, to charge your batteries is, is the round trip efficiency. Um, you know, it's not 100% by a long shot. So, you know, as Taylor says, you really want to try and use solar as soon as possible to actually power things rather than saving it for later, because when saving it, you're losing some along the way. It's highly inefficient in, in just doing it that way. Um, it's obviously better than not using it at all, but uh, using the solar power directly is, is bound to be uh, a better option, I would have thought. And, and the same goes for other renewable energy sources. Uh, incidentally, if you're looking at other types of energy storage, such as hydrogen production, that efficiency gets even lower. So um, the, the round trip efficiency of, of how you store things and how you put them back into the system is a significant consideration when you're looking at these kind of system dynamics, I think, and uh, you'll correct me if I'm wrong in any of that. Yeah, I mean, it's not, it's 80 to 90% depending on the, the battery technology. So it's not, it's not terrible. Uh, it's, it's not 100%, but it's still pretty good. Um, there is a bunch of questions here, guys, and then we have so many questions now. We only have a few minutes, really two, three minutes, so I don't really, um, these are going to have to be short answers, and uh, I'm really sorry, you know. Um, thank you very much for sending so many through. We just ran out of time. I thought we'll have plenty, but of course they kept coming. There is um, several questions here about stacking. So one of them says, uh, in the battery uh, in the battery projects that, that were realized, or uh, it's always the case that applications are stacked. You know, more than one application. Right? But they are asking a question. So, are applications stacked? Can you give examples? And then someone else asked, uh, you know, just following on on that, um, can you briefly describe the management integration software as it relates to services stacking? I'm gonna so, I'm gonna share my screen again for a second. Yep. Uh, are you able to see it? Yes. Okay, it's not changing my slide. Okay, maybe, maybe I won't be sharing my screen. <laughs> uh, so for the, when you go back and look at the example for Hawaii, you'll notice that in addition to bulk shifting four hours to the evening, the solar production also goes like this during the day with the clouds. So in terms of stacking, you're able to stack the short-term intermittency with also a longer-term um, shift in time of, in, in hours. So that would be, uh, I guess, two stacks. Uh, of course, you can stacking makes the project more complicated. It also adds more value. So I would say first start with a case where there's one use case that's very clear. Maybe 70% of the economics are going to come from one use case. And then start layering on additional use cases as needed. But if you're going to go into a project and you need 16 different use cases, it's, it's going to be a, a much more complicated process and project to actually get done. So think about really what is your key use case that can drive the project and then as added benefits, add the other ones on top of it. But you need to have like an anchor use case. Jason, would you like to add anything? Yeah, just to say that uh, I, I totally agree. Value stacking is what we're seeing in, in the industry in general is value stacking is absolutely essential to the business case, not just of um, you know, batteries and microgrids, but uh, in almost any aspect. And the more you can stack those uh, value streams, the, the better business case you have. 
Um, so I, I think it is very, it's vital that you look at how, you know, what, what different areas you can cover. And the more you can cover, the better. Uh, I think we're going to see that uh, becoming more the norm. The other thing just to say is that there are companies increasingly now that um, have analysis uh, tools that can help look at this, the, the, the business side. And furthermore, uh, there was a point earlier on about software. Um, the software around a lot of these battery systems um, is, is sophisticated to a point where it can help take advantage of those, uh, those different value streams. Um, so yeah, that's all I would say. It's definitely important and something you need to bear in mind when you're building a business case. Okay. And the last question, as we are literally nearly an hour now, is um, it's actually several questions as well, but I've just, I'm going to put it together. And it's about lifetime, uh, average lifetime of batteries. Mm -hmm. And someone here asks, you know, what are they in real terms uh, nowadays? Um, so what's the life, life, life cycle? But then someone actually makes a point to ask, if, if you have a lot of availability in a day, like huge uh, load drops and fast moving clouds. Um, does that shorten the expected lifetime of the battery a lot? To what extent does, is that the case? Uh, yeah. I can start how, how it affects the duration essentially. Yeah, that, that, was, that was it. And that will be our last question for today. Actually, there's one here that we'll see if we can get through. Yeah, go Taylor, sorry. Okay, so we've signed contracts for 20 year uh, systems. So the lifetime of an energy storage project is 20 years. Of course, uh, there's a little bit of degradation on the batteries over time. So what we do is um, we'll build a bunch of battery cabinets, but we'll leave a few empty slots. And then after maybe seven years after the batteries have lost a little bit of their charge, we'll just add another uh, cabinet into that empty slot. It's called augmentation. So that actually the battery system maintains a constant level of output. So if it was 10 megawatts on day one, it'll be 10 megawatts uh, on year 20. And, and the second part of the question was about how uh, the, the charging and discharging profile affects the battery degradation. Uh, it, the, more, uh, the more that you charge and discharge, it'll in increase the degradation. So if you're doing something like frequency regulation and constantly charging and discharging the battery, like almost at full power, throughout the day, that'll degrade much more quickly than a, a, a system like the one in Hawaii where you're doing a four hour time shift for one cycle per day um, type of application. So, uh, so that affects, so there's an age degradation, there's a charging and discharging profile degradation. Um, so both those things impact it. Thank you very much, Jason. Anything to add? Uh, no, I, I think that's a, a brilliant point. I think the, 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 the only thing I would say is that when you're looking at these battery projects, today's battery costs aren't the ones you're going to be dealing with in two or three years' time, five years' time, ten years' time when these batteries uh, need replacing. So, you know, uh, it, it's very feasible, actually, as, as uh, Taylor says, to kind of actually have a, a, a system which today makes economic sense is going to make more economic sense, even with the depredation taken into account. Okay, thank you. And, uh, you know, it's time now, but can I just ask you, there is a question here that sounds more like bait than a question, which is 100% renewables is not economical, agree? Um, what, what do you guys think? Obviously, it depends what, how much it costs the energy in each place. And I mean, batteries are not necessarily the only way to get, you know, 24 hours renewable, but Taylor, do you think it's economical? It's not? In Puerto Rico, that's what we're proposing 100%. So. Uh, it depends on the situation, uh, of course. In, in some cases, yes. Um, but even if you can't get to 100% today, it doesn't mean it's worth, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't try to get to 25 or 50% today and, and use it as a stepping stone. So just because you can't go to 100% doesn't mean you shouldn't do anything at all. And Jason? Yeah, I totally agree with uh, Taylor's point. This is, you know, the, the, the models that we see at the moment do indicate that 100% can be prohibitively cost, uh, costly at this point in time. Uh, but as somebody told me the other day, you know, people didn't move out of the Stone Age because they ran out of stones. It, you know, you've got to try and head towards something because you think it's worth shooting for. Uh, we need to try and, uh, you know, just cut down the cost wherever we can, uh, cut down the carbon intensity wherever we can. If that means aiming for 100% and getting 80% of the way there, and that's still a good result right now. So 
I think we, you know, we definitely need to move in that direction. Um, and the 100% question, will, will, the answer will come in time. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you very much, Taylor. Thank you very much, Jason, for sharing with us your expertise. Uh, both Taylor and Jason have agreed that we're going to do one in Spanish as well for those people out there. So uh, we may be knocking on your door very soon again. Thank you very much to everyone that attended. And I'm looking forward to seeing you again in the next online session. Thank you very much. And I'm just going to say goodbye now. Goodbye, guys. Bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.